Dan Westfall, financial extraordinaire. <laughs> What's happening? Glad to be here. So I know you. I, I, I was do, crunching the numbers. Mm -hmm. Pretty good at it, as you know. Five years almost that I've known you. No, I've only lived here for three. I moved here in 2020. So it would have been right after that because I joined uh, Go Workspace so four like, years. right after that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I rounded yeah, up. Yeah, four years actually. <laughs> so three years, three years because it was the end of 2020 when I moved here. So Man, yeah. it feels like a lot longer. Yeah. Um, but going on four. Yeah. I See, that's why I have you. I was going to say, <laughs> I was like, that's that's not your that's not your lane. It's I stay in my numbers lane. guy. And you, you know that all too for well. Sure. And we're going to dive into that. Yeah, <laughs> so for sure. This is a perfect way to start. Yeah, we we worked at the same office. I worked with you on Client Focus Financial, which is your your business, which is thriving. Um, working on your website, your marketing. We worked together in a networking group called NPI. And thank you for inviting me to that. I I'm just trying to, trying to drag you there. So get you making money. It so, took a little, yep, but it yep. worked. And I appreciate that. Uh, you were president at the time, mm -hmm. and now I'm vice president. So the turntables. Yep. <laughs> so, uh, that was my lot. That was my big picture plan, actually. Get so, me in there. Yeah. No, I really appreciate it, and I appreciate our partnership and friendship. And it's been it's been really cool getting to know you, and Likewise. you've taught me a lot. Um, and you also manage me and my family's investments, which mm -hmm. is. Enormous because I tried to do Robin Hood for like a year. Mm -hmm. It sucked me in. I mean, it was awesome and it was really insightful and I learned a lot. But I also learned that I cannot be in this realm. It's too much pressure. It was it was consuming me. And I wasn't doing a lot. And I was like working with a thousand bucks or something. Mm -hmm. I started with like a hundred and I kept getting pulled in. But it, there was some tug to it, and I kind of wanted to start there on like, what drew you to the finance realm? How did how did you find yourself in this? Yeah, so I um, I started making money my first job, and I think you know you actually know this like this story. But my first job was working for my older brother, uh, running my older brother ran the the Trenton Times, which was the local newspaper in New Jersey. And he uh, got that when he was, he got a route when he was 12. And as his younger brother, I was nine at the time. Um, my dad wanted me to help him out. So we were both kind of like involved in it and things. And after a little while, Andrew ended up getting to the point where he didn't really need his younger brother helping him out. And my dad still wanted to have me involved in it and made him basically keep me involved in some way. So he decided he hated going around to collect for the paper. So what he did is he had me go around to collect and he paid me 15% of whatever I collected. So that was at like nine, 10 years old, you know, making 20, 30 bucks every other week was, was a lot of money for a nine, 10 year old. And you don't have anything to spend money on as a nine, 10 year old. Like I can remember um, like where are we going down the street to the liquor store which ironically had candy so it was like the <laughs> it was like the draw in oh that's and, great and and yeah it's like that's how they get you and going there and like getting candy and stuff like this it's like well what do you spend money on as like a 10 year old nothing so but otherwise it was just literally saving money and it got to the point where um i'd saved enough money my dad's like you should put this money in a cd at the bank and so i was like what is a cd and he explained he's like yeah you make you know, five, six percent, just leaving your money sit there. And I was like, well, this is great. Like, I'm not using it anyway. Like, let's put it there. So that was the first investment I ever made was um, putting my money in a bank CD. And I kind of love the idea of it because I'm like, well, I'm not working or doing anything. Let's make more money with it. Um, as as kind of time went on, making more money and saving more money and things, my um, always was big into sports growing up and uh, my older brother we had one tv at the house and my older brother when he was 18 got a sky trade account which uh, sky trade was like the kind of like a robin hood it was then eventually bought out by td ameritrade td ameritrade was bought out by josh schwab so so on and so forth but he was trading on there and he would watch jim kramer's mad money at six o'clock which always pissed me off because that was right when Sports Center was. So <laughs> it was like if I wasn't there, he was watching that, and I was kind of just forced to watch it with him. And if you don't know who Jim Cramer is, Jim Cramer is a 
uh, financial personality, like very over the top personality and like very excitable. But he used to run a hedge fund, super smart, and he's still on CNBC today. And he really kind of just makes it entertaining to learn about investing in stocks. And that was really watching him kind of forcibly at that point was drew me into it where I was like, oh, wait, you can invest money in stocks and make even more than like five, six percent. And then that kind of drew me into that over time to where, you know, eventually I opened up my own Scott Trade account and started investing. And that was right in the beginning of the great financial crisis. Um, I just went to college, had opened up the Scott Trade account in the summer of 2008, put 500 bucks in to start it. And then the stock market dropped off that fall really dramatically. It was down like 30% just that fall. And um, so everything was on sale. Everything was on sale. So when, you know, kind of like full circle, when COVID happened and things really dropped off and there was this big hype around younger people getting like the Gen Z people getting involved with investing and doing all the, the trading through Robinhood, it for me was kind of like, well, this is the way that I got involved was through a big drop off like that. And it wasn't just because of that, but it was definitely more exciting that literally everything I put my that I bought went up eventually because the bottom of the great financial crisis was March of 2009. So I was buying stuff in like the summer of 2008 into the fall into the winter and it was buying it while everything was dramatically on sale and six months later everything was dramatically higher. So um, it was it's definitely fun to make money when you're investing in stocks. But sure. Um, it's a long-term thing too. It's not like a CD where it's guaranteed. And, and that's um, that sparked my interest in investing. And then when I was in college, I eventually changed my major to finance with the idea that I wanted to manage other people's money. And, you know, that was like half of our class were finance, you know, all of our, of the finance majors, half of them were like, yeah, I'm going to be a financial advisor. And as, as far as I know, I'm the only one that, you know, after a few years was a financial advisor of the, that we went, I went to a relatively small college. So, um, not a lot of people make it as a financial advisor past their third year. So it's definitely, you know, I'm in a good position where it's exciting to be able to work with people and you know, help people like you and your family out with, with investing. So, oh yeah, it's really important because number one there is a lack of education early on and even through college on like, what do you do with money? How do you manage it? Or even the business side of things, you know, you have to like learn it in the real world or knowing someone like you, you know, for me, I went to school for computer graphics and creative production and film and audio. There's no class on that, at least forced on me. I should have, mm -hmm. I took like a business class, um, but it's extremely valuable. It like runs everything. Yeah. You know, money's, unfortunately, you know, you need money to, to live and do things. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I see that, I see it a lot with like the, the education behind money is it's generational. So, you know, this gets, you can see, you know, if somebody grew up in a household where they didn't have a lot of money or had poor financial habits and you know, that that's just passed down generationally until somebody learns about money and investing and finances and changes that. So, you know, I was lucky to grow up where my dad's like, hey, put your money in CDs. So now my parents weren't people that really outside of their retirement plans put money into stocks. That just was not what they grew up with because when, you know, my parents were, you know, closer to my age, CD rates were like close to 10%. So for them to put money in stocks, what didn't really make a whole lot of sense. It was also a lot harder for people at that point to invest in stocks. There weren't, you know, things like Robinhood out there where it's an app on your phone. So it's it's definitely become more um, normalized for people to, to be able to open up a brokerage account and invest in stocks. But I see it definitely you know, generationally. And I see it within my own client base with the, and this gets into like, you know, race and money and, you know, economic levels, because, you know, there's a reason why there's such a dramatic disparity in net worth between different races out there. And it's, it's generational and it's how people are taught about money because that happens from their parents. And if their parents didn't have money or, you know, had a lot of debt and then likelihood is is that they are too just because of where they're learning their financial habits from so um, i see it you know every day with people that i come across and talking with them because 
majority of people out there don't have the type of money that they should have, you know, based on their age. So it's at least, I'm sure there's statistics out there that are more exact than this, but I know like 50% of people live paycheck to paycheck and, you know, if not higher percentage, you know, even higher of a percentage don't have any money in, you know, savings if there was some dramatic event that they had to spend $5,000 for, you know, they would automatically be used, putting that on a credit card. And and that's that just starts that spiraling effect of, you know, negative financial habits and, you know, putting them in the hole, basically, where they're just always trying to stra- scratch and claw to get out. So, and then eventually it hits the point in their life where they need to really either dramatically save money or they get to the point of no return where they're just never going to have the kind of money that they need to have to retire or live you know, a financially stable life. Um, and, and that's, it's sad to see, but it's all choices that are, are made. Everybody has the same opportunities. It's just that the, the choices that people make based on the information that they, that they have isn't, you know, aligning with long-term, you know, financial prosperity. So that's the thing. Number one, it's a slippery slope from one bad decision, you know, a credit card debt here or there, and you have to dig yourself out just to get back to ground zero. But second, you know, that mindset of the long term, a lot of people may be thinking about the year, if that, rather than like, okay, like for me, don't touch what you're helping me with then until I'm, what, 60, Mm -hmm. Um, because then we can pull that out, you know, and that's going to be a large chunk when we just let it grow, Mm -hmm. because it's not a lot now. You've helped it grow from where it was, certainly, but at that time, but I mean- what do you think is like the main way to break those cycles? If someone's in, you know, raised where their parents are just making bad decisions and not financially literate. It's, it's, it's education. Yeah. And like, that's the sad thing is that you, like, I grew up, but we didn't have finance class. Even my, you know, my college, I was a finance major. You don't have like personal finance classes. It was very, I didn't really learn a whole, whole lot about investing until I actually got into, you know, uh, my first job actually so in with a financial services company and that was really where I started learning more about investing because even college level courses are very high in the sky type of stuff where it wasn't getting down into like the nitty-gritty of like well what should you be saving what are percentages you should be saving you know should you be saving five percent because your company matches five percent or should you be saving ten percent because you should be saving in total twenty percent of your paycheck and Part of that should go to short-term savings and part of that should go to retirement. So, you know, and those are, you know, different like things that just aren't taught out there and and helping people understand like basic financial principles of budgeting and, you know, the rule of 72, which is, you know, talking about how often your money doubles and things. So, um, you know, simple thing if you don't know what the rule of 72 is. I was just is. about to ask. Yeah. So yeah, I saw the look on your face. <laughs> the rule of 72 is if you divide uh, the interest rate that you're making on money into 72. So say it's one, for example, you keep, keep it, keep it basic math here for you. Beth. Thank you. But, so one into 72 is 72. So if you had an investment that you're making 1% on and you wanted that money to double, it's going to take 72 years. So if you were making 2% on that, it's going to take 36 years you know, 3% would be was it, 24 years, so so on and so forth. So, you know, if you're making uh, 10%, which like the S&P 500, which is this uh, stock market index of the 500 largest U.S. companies in the, in the U.S., um, that's made roughly about 10% over the last 100 years, you know, including dividends reinvested. So that would take your money, and this is like for retirement money, your money should be doubling in a retirement account if it's fully invested in stocks roughly every seven years, give or take. So, you know, that's a good rule of thumb. So that way people can kind of think about like, well, what am I making on my money? So like people that have money sitting in a savings account right now that make nothing, it's like, well, your money's really not, you're, you're not, you're not just not making money, you're actually losing money to inflation, which, you know, inflation right now, the last month was like 3.4% and average inflation that the Fed's targeting is like two and a half percent over time. So minimally, if over time you're not making two and a half percent on your money, you're actually losing money, even though people always think they're like, oh, it's in my safe at the house or it's in my bank account. And it's like, well, 
that's great, but you're you're losing money every year right. to to inflation because stuff is always going to be more expensive 10, 15, 20 years from now than it is today. Yeah. So, and those are just basic, those are like basic financial principles that like there should be a class that every senior in high school has to pass and has to pass at like a higher level than just like your gym class because and that, that, that's probably the most important thing that they could take away from, you know, any class that they're going to take throughout their, you know, one, K through 12 education is is personal finances because they're going to be affected by it. You know, even if they're a trust fund baby, they're still going to be affected by it. So, oh, yeah. Um, and that's where, like, you see, I see, like, my overall client base, I take money from anybody and everybody who has it. And I can see based on, you know, race specifically and like in our country right now there there's a lot of issues going on that revolve around race and things like that and and a lot of it i think comes back to money and people don't want to talk about it but that's you know a big big problem around it of hispanic and and black you know families not having the same kind of money as white or asian families so you know i see that you can see like statistically with net worth you have and this was like something in the wall street journal i saw this was probably a year ago like the average net worth for white people was like, and this is all ages, was like 150000 So, and that's including like equity in your house and retirement, savings, all that type. For black and Hispanic, it was like twenty five, thirty thousand. 30000 So that's a dramatic Holy difference. Holy moly. And, you know, and a lot of that goes into like home ownership and, you know, types of jobs that, that, you know, that they have that may not have a retirement plan to it. So, but that's a really dramatic disparity and it's like well of course there's going to be social issues revolving around race when you have you know white people and i think asian people were very close to to what white people were at as far as net worth goes but of course you're going to have that you know that that kind of conflict out there when you have you know one race or a couple races that have dramatically higher net worth and then you have others because you're going to have issues around tax and you're going to have issues around social programs and and all those, uh, these other things that affect both in dramatically different ways. And it all comes back, I see it all, all comes back to education. So, you know, why, why do white people have more money? Well, generationally, white people were learning about money and saving and investing and buying homes versus 100 years ago, you know, black people weren't, you know, saving, owning, buying homes. You know, that was like dramatically in our country is just a very different world. Yeah, so it's an unfortunate fact. Yeah, and that's something that, yeah, that's just our country history. So, but the big thing uh, that can change is now everybody has the same opportunities, you know, and that's where y- you can't cry like, oh, well, we need, you know, reparations or whatever. Like, it's like, no, 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 you have the same opportunities. So, you know, one of my one of my best friends I went to college with, uh, my boy Sam, first generation to go to college, you know, black dude, He he works for the Department of State make six figures. He's the first person in his family, like, quote unquote, to like make it, so to speak. So, but came from like classic, you know, upbringing where dad wasn't around all the time. There was also the, um, you know, public assistance, things like that. But, but he had the same opportunity that everybody else has. So, and he took advantage of it. He went to college, you know, got student loans, made the most of it, actually took that as an investment because I think a lot of people go to college and just go just because they're supposed to and don't look at it. It's like college is an investment in your future income. So if you're going to just go to college and, you know, go get like, uh, become like a history major in college, like what are you going to do with that? You know? So teach history. Yeah. You're going (laughs) to teach history. It's like, okay, like you have a very small like outlook. You know, I remember there was a there was a major at, at your college where I went to school in Pennsylvania, um, rec and leisure, and I'm just like, oh my god, this is like the biggest joke major out there. It's just the kids that smoke weed that just want to chill and get their school. <laughs> so like, you know, like that's not like a real, you know, like what are you doing with that? Like you're they want to teach park, gym. You're gonna be a park. You're gonna be a park ranger. Or, yeah, <laughs> you know. So like, that's where I think people just don't think through, like at a younger age, and it's pushed on so many people to just go to college. When, you know, reality, the, the trades, you know, plumbing, electrical, um, HVAC, like all that, those, those people make a ton of money. And I think of this, one of my other best friends growing up, my buddy Donnie, we've been friends since we were two, grew up right behind me. He's like, you know, like my brother. 
So he, he, he was, he's definitely not a school person. And he would say that he went to community college, ended up going to then trade school, getting into HVAC. He makes well enough of six figures doing HVAC. So, you know, and, and they've helped pay for him to go back and get his bachelor's degree now so he can move up with a management. So like there's, there's so much opportunity out there and it just takes people actually putting in the effort and, you know, making a real plan to do it. And that's not just like with finances that goes with, you know, all of their economic life. So, you know, and I think that like just kind of starting out, you know, I was lucky enough that my parents were like, you need to go to college and do this because if I didn't go to college, then I wouldn't be in the position I am today. I wouldn't have been able to, you know, become a, a CFP, a certified financial planner, because, you know, you need a bachelor's degree just to sit for that. So, you know, all those different things, if I wasn't pushed to do that, would I have done that? Maybe not. So, you know, and that's, you know, it's, it's, it starts early. And I think that nowadays, like with all the information out there, you know, we're doing a podcast talking about finances and all kinds of other stuff. Like there's so much free information out there that if people want to get, you know, learn about whatever the topic is, they can go out and do it. So I think finances or personal finances, especially, you know, are a very hot topic, so to speak. Like I see a ton of it on my you know, on my Instagram because partially probably because of my job and oh, you know, yeah. big brother knows what I do, but <laughs> it, you know, I still see all these different, you know, people out there putting out content about personal finance, which I think is great because, you know, the more people talk about it, the more people know. And that's, it's one of those things that like growing up, the, the, the three things you don't talk about is sex, religion, and, and, you know, people's money. So, you know, or politics. So you throw that in there too, I guess. But you know, and, and thankfully for, I guess me, I never listened to my parents. So I talked to, you know, it's like, don't talk to strangers. Like I talk to strangers every day and I talk to them about their money. <laughs> so, um, but it, it's, it's a taboo topic to talk about money and it shouldn't be because everybody needs money and it shouldn't be a, a, this thing looked at like, oh, well, I don't have money or I don't want to talk about money. I don't want to talk about my income. Like, you know, I, it's not that difficult when somebody tells me like what their job is, like that they're like, Hey, I'm a nurse. All right. I, I know roughly around what you make, you know, that doesn't make me think any more or less of the, you know, people. So, and I think there's just too much, it's, it's still too taboo to talk about money as loosely as we should be talking about money because people grew up where it was just weird to talk about and yeah. it wasn't socially acceptable to, to talk about money or, or things. And, even within groups of friends, like more of my friends talk to me about money just because of what I do. But I know that it's not just, you know, with people that, that I've talked to, it's not just a very common topic uh, for, for people to talk about. I also know it's, it's probably more of a common topic for guys to talk about money versus women to talk about money, especially amongst friends. So, you know, just from like, girl like female friends that 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 I've had and uh, throughout the years because it's different from from that standpoint because it's not the common topic versus men are like hey like let's talk more about this because you know we ever guys are just I guess naturally I'm sure there's some sort of biology behind this of like trying to protect and provide is just that's more exactly of an, it. Yeah, more I of mean, an instinct history males have been providers you know hunters through time I'm sure that's shifting a little more, sure. but you know, I mean, I knew that that question would get you going because yeah, yeah. it's like, what's, how do you help humanity? E- education is at the root of pretty much everything, in my opinion, where access to more information or better upbringing through an educational lens helps in so many different areas of the world. It would help with conflict, it It'll helps with finance, it helps with people's happiness in pursuing what they love. It's at the root of everything. So um, more of that, and I wanted to speak because something that you do with your business that I really respect is every month you put out a market review Mm -hmm. and it's on your website, it's on your YouTube channel. And I think that's really admirable because you stick to that and I watch those all the time and I'm like, huh. You know, I feel more grounded in what's going on and it's it's easy to listen to. I think you do a great job of that. And I... I wanted to kind of ask you about your business. Number one, how long have you owned your business and how long has it been chugging along? And number two is, 
compared to the other financial advisors, investment managers out there, what is the unique take or aspect of your business that you do that other people don't? I know. I kind of yeah, know this know, answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's but, in the name. Yeah, yeah, it is. So so I started client-focused financial in 2017. Um, I had worked for a couple other like independent broker dealers before that and um, just got to the point in my career where I was like, hey, I don't want to keep working for somebody else. Like I I can do this better and, and do this myself. So I started uh, Client Focus Financial 2017. It's a registered investment advisory firm, registered with a, a number of different states. But I came up with the name because one of the things that I had gotten a lot of clients through the beginning part of my career at that point, and I saw it was kind of like a, a void within the industry, was that a lot of advisors didn't actually focus on working with clients. Like they'd get a client and then it was just like a sale. And it was done. You know, they that just was put like, them into the system. They just yeah, and and you didn't hear from them, and you know they put them in just generic investment strategies, and we weren't actively managing or throw them at mutual funds or something like that, and just moved on to to the next sale. And you know that was something where at the time I had gotten a large majority of my clients that, from other advisors that just were like, I never hear from my advisor. I don't think that they actually do anything and like diving into it, it was like, yeah, they don't. They just sold you some mutual funds. And the reason you haven't heard from them is because they got paid a commission when they sold it to you. And then they, you know, chucked out the deuces and moved on to find the next person. So, um, you know, that was in the beginning, like one of the reasons I wanted to, to call it like title the firm client focused was just putting the emphasis, you know, putting the service back in financial services is the tagline. So love it. That was, that was really a big, you know, focus that I had of, you know, trying to get clients and really putting that customer service first and foremost. And that's one of the things that separates me from most advisors out there is, is just that I am actually staying in touch with my clients. And it sounds super simple and super basic, but it, it's probably the biggest thing that I bring to the table outside of the investment management part, which, you know, like, and you can attest to this, like most of my clients don't know nor really like care about that. Like they want to make money but they don't know all the little intricate details of things I'm doing behind the scenes and that, that that's what they pay me for. So yep, at the end of the day, what they care about is that I stay in touch with them and update them on things and, you know, talk to them and I'm available when they need me. So, you know, it's, it's such a basic thing, but that's what I found in, in my industry is, is one of the things that lacks is just customer service. I think in general, in most industries, that's the ticket. You know, it's lacking. Like for me, people don't know how to build a website or how to design a logo or all about graphic design or whatever nuance it is. And they don't necessarily care how the website's built. Does it function? Does it perform fast? Is it long lasting? Yep, yep, yep. And the big thing is that I communicate with them like, here's what we're doing. Um, here's what we're doing month to month or whatever that may be. So, I mean, I like how you put it right out front though, like the yeah. name of your business is that yeah and that goes a long way i felt that i know that a lot of people have felt that you've been very successful over these years just growing steadily that's sure. the game and you're you're a long-term thinker ever since i met you uh with our networking group that's long-term thinking sure. long-term relationship building it's a lot of things that we do for instance this podcast is long term yeah i can i'm documenting a legacy with inter interesting people that i know but also it's long-term marketing. It's inherent. I I I guess I've talked a little bit about the business sure. in some of these episodes, but that's not what it's about. Yeah. But inherently it works. And all of these things add up long term. Yeah. I don't know if you want to an answer this, but how many households do you manage? Is there a, a figure that you can put out of them uh, yeah, the amount of money over, that you it's a little over two hundred. It's all actually it's actually publicly available because I'm a registered oh, yeah. investment advisory firm. So I manage um just under forty million dollars in in assets under management. It's a little over two hundred households that, that I manage. So you know that's it's, awesome. Yeah, it's it's exciting. And like you know, my biggest thing in thinking on, you know, uh, when we were at our networking group earlier this week, Mike Marcus gave us uh, presentation talking about the one word thing and for him it was growth this year because he's having a kid trying to grow his business he'll and... be on the podcast soon oh that's cool cool yeah, yeah. he's a good man yeah. shout he'd out to good. Mike he'd be good shout out yeah <laughs> <laughs> so um, but uh, like for me it's always been consistency and it's just this strong suit because it's so easy to be inconsistent but I think it's easier to be consistent 
because like it's like I go to the gym every day you know I eat well every day like I go to work every day you know I put in that effort and in, in things every single day and it's just the consistency that yeah, I've been an uh, investment advisor for 12 years and I started obviously with no clients and, you know, I had people that I worked under at the time where I was like, man, these guys are killing it, making a ton of money. I'm like 21, 22. Like, how can I be that? And while there was, there was people that I worked with that just killed it from like early on, I was like, I'm not that person, but like I can put in the work and just be consistent. And I think that that's where most people could fall into that if they just can focus on being consistent with whatever they're doing, whether it's their personal life with their health or they're trying to start a business with their business or in their career, whatever it is. It's just being consistent and doing those things that like, I mean, I was in my 20s working like 10, 12 hours a day for six, seven years really as I was growing things. And, you know, I know, you know, like relationships I had at the time, they were like, ah, oh, I'd love to see you more. But I got bigger picture goals. And the thing <laughs> is, is, they're not around today, but my, you know, I've reached those goals and I'm kind of hitting those points. And if, you know, ultimately th that was something that I had as a bigger picture thing that I don't want to be in my thirties having to, I'm 33 now, like I didn't want to be in my thirties struggling, you know, and to grow my business or financially or things like that. And, you know, I spent the time, took the steps back when needed to then, you know, take the steps forward. Cause like starting client focused financial, and when I started, I left my old firm and I didn't make money for six months. And it was like, all right, like, I hope this works. It's always a leap, you know, and I moved with, I moved with like $6 million in assets under management at the time. So, which is like not much, you know, for any other financial advisor that's listening to this out there, they're like, what? So it's, it's not a lot of money, you know, and now I think of it like my top five clients have more than that. So, you know, it's, it's just, yeah. So, and, and now you've got a big chunk of change that you're yeah, managing. Yeah. That's impressive. Yeah. So, and it's just, but it's consistency. Like there was never a year where I just was like, oh, I've killed it and just brought Skated. in $10 million of new money. It was always just, you know, two, three, four, five million a year, just consistently adding clients. And, and that can, you know, that can span a lot of different you know, industries of just being consistent and, and doing something that, you know, I'm, I'm lucky that like in my world, it's all about compounding, like compound interest and growing people's money. And by helping grow their money, it grows my, my firm revenue and things. So, you know, I, there's different ways that businesses can scale and do that with, within their own world that, that I think that, um, a lot of people can focus more on. Is your website as effective as it could be? Are you using it for more than just marketing? And do you give it constant attention? If not, you're missing out. Your website should assist with your business operations from processes and procedures to client onboarding and tasks. Your website should work for you. Here at Name & Creative, we work with all of our clients strategically from the start. Don't miss out on all the opportunity that an effective website can provide. Schedule a free consultation with us today and discover how we can get you on the right track. Yeah, a couple things. I, I resonate so much with, you know, hard things become easy when you normalize that consistency. The consistency normalizes that thing good health, hitting the gym, running, not smoking, did not doing stuff is also sure. a, a positive habit. Yeah. Or, you you know, you could go the other lay way off, and that's a crack, habit. you know? Yeah, exactly. That'll get you. Uh, <laughs> but it's like the consistency of, for me, you know, I I could take every day off because I'm the boss, but that won't, that won't yeah. work. And so I don't, but that consistency keeps it going. And I feel that very much that like, Whoa, three years ago when I started, like it was zero, literally mm -hmm. zero and took that leap like you're talking about. And now it's a lot more than zero. Sure. And it's wild. I, I And it's, it's fun to think about in five years. Um, before I go on to maybe rough spots, I wanted to, there's, there's something that I saw, it was several months ago, but is this post, it was this write up or it was a video and it was. Do you would you rather have a dollar every day yeah, for yeah. a month yeah, yeah. or a million dollars right now? It's like come by like doubling a dollar every double, day. Double and, yeah. and that do that dollar would double every day. And I was like, 
a million dollars, of course, yeah. but <laughs> then they did the it, math and I go, oh my God, yeah. I was so wrong. So you because about towards, compounding. Exactly. That, that was the most illustrative thing that I, I saw as far as like, once you, once you start to really grow that money, that's why once you save enough and you can make that money work for you, that money really works for you sure. towards the end. Yeah. Because that just compounds. It's yeah. enormous. Yeah. So, yeah, d- choose the dollar per day uh, that doubles over a month. <laughs> yeah, you definitely want that that yeah. compounding. Compounding is is yeah, it's it's definitely something that people don't take into account much, as much because it's it's consistency, it's boring, it's not exciting. Like you know, the longer you leave money sit there, the more it's going to grow. So, but I want a million dollars now. Yeah, as well, you know, again, it's like that long term mindset. These are all you know the consistency, like the thread through this conversation, and I was kind of thinking about where this would go. You know right after we set this date was, you know, the, the different things that we talk about. And, uh, mindset was certainly one of them that I'm glad we're hitting on and not surprised by it. And maybe speaking of mindset, because I think this is probably one of the things, you know, for, for both of us being business owners, it's not all like sunshine, rainbows, unicorns and money. Like there, you know, for me several months ago, I, I had a dip in my business where I'm like, oh my gosh, but now I'm in a month where it's fantastic. You know, these ups and downs. So I just wanted to ask, you know, what is one of the most, you know, difficult parts of your journey? How'd you get through that? Yeah. um, I mean, I have to think back to like the very beginning was definitely the hardest because I think I said earlier that, you know, most financial advisors don't make it past year three because the first three years suck. Most (laughs) businesses. Yeah, most businesses. But like, I think it's like, I remember... There was this dude at Ed Jones that I was when I was interviewing in college for uh, internships, and he had said he's like, I got together with him. He took me out to lunch, and he's sitting there. He's like, Yeah, ninety percent of advisors don't make it past year three. And I was like, Damn. I was like, Am I making the right decision getting into this world? And I guess the competitive nature in me was like, Sucks for that other ninety because I'm gonna be the ten. And and then ironically, he didn't give me the. the internship because he just couldn't get interns through ed jones or something like that and i was like dude i'll work for free still didn't give it to me and then you know a few years like a few years later um probably like five years after that i ended up seeing him at a like event where it was like a marketing event we were doing in the area and i saw him there's like and he didn't recognize me but i did and it was just like one of those things of like i remembered you know i was like okay you didn't give me that job and I, it was like in my mind, I was like, F, you know, F you. Like <laughs> I said, I said to you before, I wouldn't curse, so I won't. But you're doing a good job. Yeah, but if yeah, you yeah. need to, you drop no, it. No, 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 no. <laughs> but like, you know what I mean. So that's where yeah. I was. That's that's where I was. Like in that moment, he was still working at Ed Jones, talking about starting his own RA with his registered investment advisor firm with his brother-in-law. And I just remember being, I was working at an independent broker dealer at that time, and he was was talking about going independent i don't know if it was a registered investment advisor from but i was like oh, i'm already a step ahead of you and it was just like that mindset where i was like i'm always going to be a step ahead of you too because i'm just going to outwork you because you're you know and it was just like the internal shit talking that i was then like and that's just the same way with other people that i've worked with throughout the years or you know i can remember even early on like the first three years i made Total revenues, 18, 13, and 35,000. You know, 20, 2020, 12, 13, and, and 14. That was like my total revenue, which is like at the time, I remember making 35,000. That was like 35,000 revenue. Then I have my expenses. So I didn't actually make that. Uh uh-huh. So, so <laughs> yeah. So, like, I drove all the time. I was driving like 20, 30,000 miles a year because I was doing in home meetings with, with people. So I was hustling. And I remember like being talking to my mom who my mom always my mom's an accountant and she would help me out with my books and taxes and things like that and when i made 35 i was like mom killing it <laughs> and she's like yeah well you're profitable this year but uh that's not what you know you need to keep growing and and my mom always being the the half glass full or half glass empty person that that, that my mom is always the pessimistic person and me being always wanting to like prove my mom wrong kind of thing was and that was just you know something even actually getting into the industry where my mom had uh when i I interviewed and and worked uh, like kind of an internship at at, uh, morgan stanley and at the same time worked for this small little independent insurance 
you know, agency and decided to, that I wanted to work with this small little financial services company. And mom was like, oh, you need to work with the big guys like Merrill Lynch and Morgan Stanley. And I'm like, nah. And it was like, and it was just because of her saying that, that I wanted to prove her wrong to then be like an independent advisor. Sure. So, um, and it's always been that where there's always like, I can remember, you know, earlier on, like friends being like, yo, he's struggling. Like he's not making, I'm like, you know, I, I'm going to be killing it at some point. And you know, I'm going to be managing your money. So, and, and, and I am today. And that's where I know that, you know, long-term it's like, I have that 10 year outlook on it. So like, I know where at 43, where I want to be at. And I knew when I was 23 that I wanted to be here today. And, and I am, and it's in a, in a weird way, like it doesn't feel as gratifying, I guess, because I knew I'd be here, you know, it's like, you're supposed to win. But when I look back and think on like those first, like three, four years where like after year, year four, I went from 35 to then 70,000. That was like, oh, I'm actually, you know, making it so to speak where, you know, I'm making actual grown people money where like going out of college, all my friends were making you know, 40, 45, $50,000 salaries. And I'm like, literally like, I don't know what I'm making next month. Like, yep. you know, like month to month, um, because I was doing a lot of life insurance at the time to just like make commissions on, on, on things initially to like eat really. So, you know, thinking back on those times, it's definitely the hard times because there was a lot, there was definitely some moments and months where I was like, I might need to get her, might need to go get a job, <laughs> you know, I yeah. might need to be like, give this up and go work at a bank. That was like, always like my fallback. I was like, I'll work at a bank. Like, well, you know, they, they have jobs there. Luckily that we would, could get hired. You could get hired pretty quickly, but it's the perseverance through those times where that upswing is right beyond, you know, the horizon. Yeah. And that's the thing because there are always dips no matter what. And it's getting through that. Having the mindset to go, no, nope, I'm going to keep chugging along. Yeah. I think that's the difference, like EQ versus IQ. Like, I've, I've, I don't know if you've heard this before. I've heard nah. this in different, like, different, you know, personalities on, on social media talk about this. Like, IQ, obviously, is your, you know, intelligence. EQ is your emotional quotient. Uh, and it's, it's like the people that run businesses and that are super successful, while they might be smart, they're, you know, they're, they're not the smartest person in the room necessarily, but they're able to, like, overcome obstacles and power through difficult times and what they end up doing is then they end up hiring smarter people than them so you know and that's the difference i think i'm not like a you know i had a 3.1 gpa in college like i'm not super smart you know i've always been like i think you know my skill set leans more towards like being conceptual and like being able to take money and finances and break it down into basic levels i think that's something that that it, luckily for me that i have like an easy it comes easier to me. So versus like when we talk money, that's <laughs> you're shaking your head right now. You're like, nah, it's not for me. Yeah. And that's a lot of people. So that's why I have you. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, but, but I'm not sitting there doing calculus and stuff like that. Like that's not, you know, that's not my, that's not my strong suit. So, yeah. you know, but I think EQ versus IQ is, is definitely something that is overlooked, especially, you know, like there's not really a way to teach that in schools. So, you know, it's just, overcoming obstacles and really that internal fire of people. Certainly. And it's also um, hard versus soft skills kind of come into that. Yeah. Like for me, I'm using like several programs right now to record this, but if they all went away tomorrow and then I had to learn new programs, I don't care. Like I'll Figure learn it out. Yeah. yeah. It's not a big deal. I have a growth mindset as far as I'll learn. Is it? And, and now I know how to learn better, learning how to learn better. But I, I like that EQ versus IQ. That's interesting. Uh, before we move on to a, uh, a fun segment of the interview, I wanted to ask real quick what your outlook on the future of, you know, financial markets are like the big changes coming. So, for instance, like crypto hit and, mm -hmm. it, was, and, and it still up. is like, whoa, yeah. or like what happened with GameStop? <laughs> Such yeah. an interesting Should thing. Watch that Netflix on GameStop recently and like. No, but one. I it's will. It's a really good one. Actually. I'd love yeah, to. I just watched it like last week. It's good. It's a fascinating thing. Same with crypto. Like also with crypto, there's so much more that people don't think of. Like crypto, the blockchain is a technology that's well, well beyond finance. Mm -hmm. It's it's a way of like tracking. And, and so, so crypto could be used for concert ticket sales and mm -hmm. flights. And there's, there's a, that technology that was dumped on the world anonymously is incredible. However, 
you know, obviously the financial markets with Bitcoin and such, yeah. but it blew up. But I'm wondering, you know, like, do you see anything in the future that's coming? I think like, you know, I don't, I'm not like a crypto head, like one of these like crypto people, but like, I think that crypto is something that like, I compare it to what the internet was in like the early nineties. There's this, there's this really famous like interview that Katie Couric, who was a uh, host on the Today Show did in like 1993, I think, where she asked somebody, and I don't even know who it was, they're like, what? She's like, what is the internet? And oh, like today, today, like 30 years later, that sounds so dumb to ask because it's like, well, the internet's literally everything. <laughs> so, you know, but at the time, it was like, that was a very honest and real question that so many people in America had. And I think that's where we are today with crypto, where it's like, well, what is crypto? You know, like, what do you use it for? And it's like, I think that that's going to be finances as a whole is like one of the things that hasn't really changed a lot over like the last hundred years. Like, for example, when I place a trade for for you or any of my other clients that it takes, you know, it's a trade date plus three days for it to settle, which is wild that it takes that long for me to be like, let me place this trade and then I can then then process the withdrawal for you and it's like that's the wild that's crazy that it takes even more than just seconds for that to happen because the technology is there like that was the same amount of time it took in like the 1920s so it's just wild that there hasn't been this evolution within finances so i think that that's you know definitely a space that that will evolve more over the next 10 15 years um I think like sectors that that I'm very, um, I think the market as a whole, you know, for for those people that are, that are out there, like I'm a half glass full person, so I have a very positive view on the market from a long term standpoint, but especially over the next five ten years, because um, trend wise, we're in what's referred to as a secular bull market, where there's these time frames over history, where uh, markets go down and sideways, which that would be a secular bear market, and then these longer time frames where it goes up. So like going back through time, if you were to pull up a chart of the stock market and you looked at from like 1929 when the Great Depression hit through the end of World War II, you know, into the you know initial recession after World War II, markets were down and sideways. And then from like 1946 through the end of the 1960s, stocks went up like eightfold in that you know, 20 year time frame, roughly. And then we went through high inflation, high oil prices, oil shortages, like all these different things that happened in the 70s that caused the the economy to drop off dramatically, stocks drop off. And we went through that for about, you know, 10, 15 years. And then, you know, the early 80s turned around and all of a sudden inflation started dropping off because they had raised interest rates so much. And then from 1982 through 2000, stocks went up another, you know, tenfold. And, you know, that culminated with the dot-com bubble in 2000 and then we then had the 9-11 recession right after that, which, you know, that caused the market to drop off. And then a few years later, we have the great financial crisis from 2007 to 2009. So we had another like nine year stretch where markets were down and sideways. And then from 2009 through today, we've had this dramatic move higher again in the market. So if history repeats itself, which I think it's gonna, we're in the midst of another 20, 25 year upswing, which means that we would have you know, if it's 20 years, we have another, you know, five, 10 years to left in, in a bigger move higher within stocks. Um, I think there's a lot of sectors within the stock market, like semiconductor companies that are going to do really, really well. Those are companies that make chips that power your computer, your phone, your car, all these different things. Any piece of technology has a, a semiconductor in it. And that's companies like NVIDIA, AMD, Intel. Um, I think that those are going to do really well because of artificial intelligence and just about that yeah yeah i think that's going to be the big that's going to be a big move with um technology as a whole is, is ai uh over the next 10 years and then you know one of the other sectors i think is going to do really well is um home construction home builders um because there's the millennial uh demographic is the largest demographic out there so that's people born i think it's like 1981 to 1996 fall into the millennial demographic and we're the largest demographic because, you know, the baby boomers were the largest demographic and a lot of us are kids of baby boomers. And, you know, the reason I think that home builders are going to be a huge uh, growth segment is because there's such a housing shortage. And we see this now with housing prices going up dramatically. I mean, we live in St. Pete and St. Pete is, you know, super expensive to, to actually live in, whether you want to rent or own. 
but you know to get like you know uh, a house in the u.s like it's it's gone up dramatically but there's just not a lot of houses available and millennials are renting at a higher rate which eventually they're going to get to that spot where you know millennials we've all done stuff slower you know than previous generations where you know it took us longer to get jobs it took us longer to because a lot of that had to do with the great financial crisis but it took us longer to get jobs you know it takes us longer to get married have family buy a house like do all those things that traditionally people do you know at least at a larger scale and we're doing that all later in life so i think that we're going to see this huge influx of you know people that are millennials eventually settling down and buying houses versus you know, moving around like gypsies and, you know, running place to place. I, I think that at some point, you know, millennials were going to grow up and want to want to actually have a house. And that's going to cause the next big leg of demand in housing. So um, people think right now, I, I get this a lot, that people are like, oh, we're waiting for housing prices to drop. I'm not a realtor, but like just from an economic standpoint, don't do that because I don't think housing prices, and this is like on the U.S., but especially in the Tampa Bay area, like housing prices aren't dropping off dramatically. There's only and, so much space. Yeah. You can only grow up. Well, they could, it can always drop off like that. People thought that in like, you know, 2005, 2006, that real estate always goes up in value. And then we had the great financial crisis that was caused by, you know, the housing bubble. But it, that, so the market, it can go down, but demographically it's, pushing us higher because there's going to be more people that want to buy houses. So that's one of the biggest pushes. Historically, that's always a big push, you know, in, in all kinds of different economies um, is, is larger populations. That's what we saw in the um, post-World War II was that we had all these baby boomers being born and people settling down, buying houses, all these things. And that ended up driving, you know, the economy at, at that point. And then you had your Gen Xers being born in the 70s and, and early 80s. And, you know, not surprisingly, there was a smaller, smaller demographic. And then you then roll into the 80s and early 90s. And that's when your baby boomers were, you know, our age in their 30s, where they're, you know, settling their, you know, good job, saving, spending money, uh, setting, but getting married, buying houses, like doing all those things. And that drove the economy, you know, up pretty dramatically for 20 years. So, um, I think that's what we're in the middle of right now is a big demographic push. So um, that's one of the issues that like other other countries like Japan, who has had a, a shrinking population and very old population, their their stock market's gone sideways for like 30 years <laughs> because of their predominantly it's their, demog their, their demographics there. So they Gosh. just don't have the people to to grow the economy. Yeah, makes sense. Well, I think we'd have to do a whole part two on uh, outside yeah, of the, yeah, sure. the U.S. If we start talking about the world, that's, a you know, because also like Forex. Once I learned about like foreign exchange, you know, my, my wife is from Turkey and I've been watching what's happening with the Turkish lira. Okay. And I'm like, whoa. And it's just thinking about like people move money to make money. And there's like foreign exchange. Mm -hmm. It's way of investing, which is just wild to think about and also like being in turkey you know the lines at banks of people like taking out cash or or uh using u.s dollars or taking out u.s dollars really actually interesting because a lot of people want to put u.s dollars in turkish banks because it's more valuable take out their lira convert it to u.s dollars but anyways i think we're gonna have to do a part yeah, two yeah yeah <laughs> we just talk more about that for sure yeah um because my goodness, I mean, what, like, you're in such a realm where it touches everybody, mm -hmm. you know? Like, for me, not everybody needs a logo or a website or marketing. Everybody needs money at right. the end of the day, unless you're, you know, you inherited a farm and you're yeah. living off the land, yeah. and good for you. Yeah, I think I think it's always funny. Like, I, I don't hear it a ton anymore, but people that, people that say that it's like, oh, I don't, you know, I don't need money to be happy. I was like, well, it's real happy. It's real hard to be happy without money. So, yeah. you know, like that's, you know, happy, happiness and, and money don't correlate directly, but if right. you don't have any money, you're probably thinking about money more than happiness. So that's a great way to put it. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That'll go on one of the quotes. Okay. So, uh, reach to spot the rapid fire section. Let's do it. So, uh, essentially everybody wins in this. I'm okay. keeping score, but the points don't matter. And if you can try to keep your answer short. 
Okay. But I ask guests this consistent questions just to see the common threads and the differences between everybody okay. uh, because they're both. Uh, so just a, just a handful of questions for you. Number one, what is your biggest source of inspiration? My biggest source of inspiration? That's super deep. Um, I, I guess like just that want to like be better and, you know, have a better life for myself, future family. Like that's, that's definitely something. So I guess you could say family. Short, concise. I had my grandma on the the show in the last episode, and that was her answer. Family. Yes. That was like all we talked about, though. Yeah. Yeah, I like that answer. Yeah. For me, especially like with a new daughter, that's a driver. Yeah. Oh, for sure. But it certainly has been. All right. Do you have a favorite book? Um, I don't like. That's one of my my weaknesses is reading, but um, I listen to audiobooks. So good to great by Jim Collins is one where it talks about how like companies that were good companies became great companies. So um, that's that's definitely one that that pops to mind. So yeah, that that's be, a good one. I'm sure there's others. I was just reading one that probably not on the top five, but you know, all, all books are like I like like a lot of business books or like self development that type of stuff. So. Um, but good to great was was definitely one of them that that I really like from a business standpoint. So even just that title is really empowering. Mm-hmm. Where it, again, it's like a mindset thing. Where you know, there's always a level up mm-hmm. if you're in the right mindset to take it there. There's also a good book that I was required at one of my former jobs to read good to great and a, a book called Mindset. Mm. Um, and those were both really really good. Uh, there's also one called the Checklist Manifesto, which was also really, really okay. good. But I'm I'm there with you. Like anything, anything that you're reading to like push the envelope in yourself. Yeah, you can't go wrong. Yeah, yeah, and just learning more. It's yeah, books. I I mean I I've never I've always been like nonfiction. I don't read like you know or listen to fiction books because it just like doesn't you know I watch Netflix for that. So yeah, yeah, I I read a nonfiction here and there, but usually it's like a hard science, and so it's based in r- reality. Sure, like oh, this could happen. Yeah, yeah, you know, but it's sci-fi and out there. But it's like eh, it's rooted sure. in reality. Sure, sure, sure. yeah. Uh, do you have a favorite musical artist or a favorite album? Um, I don't. You know, I'm. It's kind a of, tough one. Yeah, I'm. I'm like, I'm not really like. I know you're a musician, so you're probably just like, oh, yeah, you could name that right off the top of your head. I really don't. I listen to all kinds of music and. It's really, you know, whatever, whatever mood that I'm in. Like if I'm at the gym, I'm listening to something then I'm different than probably what I'm listening to in my car. But yeah, Spotify is good for that. Just helping me mix it up. So yeah. Just to let you know, that's like my answer. Being a musician, it's actually, it, it, I feel like it's even harder. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. And it really does depend on my mood. Last night, you know, I ended the day very late uh, listening to like classical instrumental. Okay. But you know, earlier that day I was listening to something heavier. Yeah, I go all over. Uh, it's just like where the wind takes me and what I'm feeling in that moment. I could see that. I could see yeah. that. Yeah, you, you got a little hippie in you. Yeah, <laughs> my uh, yeah, my my parents are both in that in that realm. Yeah, uh, shout out to both our moms and yeah and families and dads. <laughs> all right, um, do you have a favorite business tool? Favorite business tool, like in my own business or in general. Well, and I mean, I use my CRM every day. So that's literally the yeah. first thing that came to mind, but that's literally just organizing my life. That's a, that's a big one. I, yeah. I feel you on that. Yeah, maybe my CRM, I don't know. Like that's probably like the most important thing. It's which just seems such a basic thing, but yeah, like that's as far as a business tool goes, that's like, like if I didn't have my CRM, I have, I don't know what, I guess I would use a spreadsheet, like, you know. God, right. yeah. no. So, yeah, that would be chaos. So You say you say CRM is a basic thing because it's basic to like anyone in course, business, now. I guess. Yeah. You got to have it, yeah. but it gets so deep once I you start to people, I like when I talk to some small businesses that don't have it, I'm like, "What do you mean you don't have it? Like how do you run your day?" <laughs> Not even small businesses. Businesses yeah. that I work with that have been around like 20, 30 years. I'm like, "What are you doing?" I'm like, "You don't have like tasks or follow-ups or client notes or whatever." Yeah. Uh, so that's, I don't, yeah, I couldn't, I, I wouldn't, my business wouldn't function without my CRM, which ironically is like one of the cheapest things that, that I pay for every month is my CRM, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, I feel you on that. That's, that's certainly up there and, it, and it's more and more important as we scale yeah. too, uh, because there's so many moving parts and that helps condense it all mm-hmm. and keep us on track. So I feel you. Uh, last one. How do you define success? Um, happiness, like time, flexibility. Um, or like flexibility with my time, enjoyment of like what I do. 
So, you know, I've, I'm definitely in a spot in my career where I, I enjoy what I do. I don't slave, you know, by any means. Like I talked about in my 20s, working 10, 12 hour days. Like I don't work, I barely work six hour days anymore. So like it's very, very different. And a lot of that, it's just been intentional because I don't, you know, my goal isn't to slave and work 40, 50 hours a week. Like if I'm working 30, I'm grinding, you know, like that's, but I'm also like, work working with those 30 hours so it's not just playing around yeah intentional for me like time flexibility you know happiness being able to do what i want when i want that's why i got into you know running my own business and didn't want to go work for like the big guys and just make a ton of money because i was like i don't want to just be that person that's 50 60 years old with a ton of money and hates their life and doesn't have a uh, connection with their family or a spouse or you know like their kids like things like that like i don't I see that so much in my industry with advisors because it is very, you can always, there's always another level because we're just talking about numbers and money. So you can always manage more money, more clients, have more advisors. You can grow it to like an infinite level, but at what cost? And for me, I look at that like there's, you know, levels that I'm, that, that I'm at now and that I'm very close to where I'm like, is it, you know, like the, to me to work 50 hours a week for the next year to get there isn't worth the quality of life that, that I'd give up by doing that because I've already given that up, you know, years ago in my twenties and I did that intentionally. So I have to do that at 33. So set yeah. Yeah. Set yourself up and you've kind of already answered, you know, by the way, for you sure. won rapid for fire. Sure. Congratulations. It's winning is good job. Winning. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't yeah, need a medal. Yeah. Medals at the door. Participation trophy. No. <laughs> You have a plaque. You had a plaque for a little employee like, of the month, most valuable yeah. employee yeah, of the month. I dated got that for me actually. <laughs> that's great funny, on your but, desk. Yeah, it's a picture of me. It said employee but, of the month. Yeah. I'm like, I'm the only employee. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love that. Just to kind of wrap things up, I wanted to talk about you know some general tips that you know you could leave people with ways that people could avoid common pitfalls and mistakes. Um, being aware of you know how they manage their finances. What's what's like one or two nuggets that you can yeah, leave I mean, the listener I think with? Like a, some, I'll just talk super basic stuff is having money in like an emergency fund. While it's just super boring, it, it also is like, you don't want to invest money that you might need for your car getting fixed or whatever it is, because the last thing you want to do is then go into credit card debt if you do have an emergency, because that's the vicious spiral because you're paying 20, 25% for interest on your credit card if you're holding the balance. So um, I think that that's a simple one. And then just being consistent with saving towards retirement because it's going to come up. And, you know, I see it a lot with people that live just on Social Security. And that's not the spot you want to be at in retirement is living on Social Security income because that's that was created to make sure that people weren't in poverty in their retirement years. But if you're living just on Social Security, you're basically poverty. So, yeah. Yeah, so, like, that's it's hard. Not the spot you want to be at. So I think, you know, having three to six months of money just sitting in a savings account and, you know, then having, you know, consistent amount that you're putting away towards retirement. And that should be like a percentage of your income, you know, minimally 5%, if not 10% of your income should be going towards retirement so uh my grandma always had always said grow like growing up she's like you save 20 percent and 20 percent and she's like that's that's how i bought this house and it was like 20 percent like well obviously like 20 percent when you're a kid doesn't really seem like much because you make 100 bucks it's like 20 bucks adults for some reason it's like what like 20 percent like that's so much i'm just like well you need to be saving for the future and you know you need to have money and I think it's too common for everybody to have that keeping up with the Jones mentality of like, oh, well, these people have this or these people have that. And it's just like, well, you're not them. So, and I think there's too much of that, you know, status sort of stuff going on where people don't just focus on themselves and what they need to do and taking care of themselves and their family. So um, I would say, you know, emergency funds, having three to six months in there you know, consistently saving five, 10% towards retirement. And then the other, you know, you should be saving 20 in total because the other 10% should be going towards either your emergency fund or what I refer to as like the middle bucket where it's like a, you know, a taxable account that um, you're, that's invested. So for like those 
bigger things that come up over time. So, but, but yeah, those three things I think are probably the important little foundational things I could leave people with. You taking notes out there, people? Yo, if you don't, just rewind. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Don't need notes anymore. <laughs> yeah, you can always listen back on this over and over again because Dan's voice and way of speaking <laughs> is so soothing. Well, it's not honestly, like Eric, with it's talking not about Nutting finances cycles. and stuff. Yeah, no, 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 no. Not that's, quite that's that level, level. My goodness. Yeah, appreciate that. <laughs> Listen to episode yeah. one and you'll get a yeah. <laughs> you'll get a really good taste of Eric. Good man. Anyways, uh, so that I think that's fantastic. And just th- this whole conversation is extremely practical. And that's like the power of your outlook and your approach to finances. I think, that, you know, that's going to propel you continually into the future is your accessibility, your personal touch on everything, the the focus on the client and that person is is huge. I I get the privilege of sure. like seeing you weekly. Love it. So you. Love we can kind of stay on the pulse with each other That's inherently. Nice. That's heartwarming. <laughs> it is. I I enjoy our time and I continue to. So hence you're here and and I I really appreciate you. And I wanted to know, you know, the la- kind of the last thing is where are you seeing yourself uh, in five, 10 years? What are your future goals? Are you going to scale up the firm? Do you see yourself with people yeah, under I you? Yeah, I do. I mean, advisors? it's something actually I've been debating over the last like six months or so is hiring people. And I'm just not quite at that point where I want to focus my time on training someone. Like I want to get to the point where I'm not really, where I'm personally not bringing in new clients, but I'm bringing in new clients for another advisor basically so um i'm not at that point yet but nearing that and i think like within the next couple years i'll be there so um you know that's that's really where the scaling happens and but it all comes back to like quality of life like the things that i do this for like i don't want to just create more work to create more work totally it's a lot of work managing other people so you know i have a good i have a good amount of time flexibility and other stuff so that's one of the things that plays into it where I was like, well, I don't want to be doing two things, working 50 hours a week again and, you know, not be, not enjoying running the business and working with clients and doing all the things that I like to do, you know, outside of the business. So. Cool. And I know you've got yeah. your 20 year plan. You know, you saw yourself when you're 23, where you're going to be at in 33 and yeah. so on and so forth. So that's certainly not surprising. And I know you'll achieve those goals and exceed them, uh, especially at the rate you're going now. And like, with your growth mindset, plus with That's friends true. like all around us um, in our networking group and beyond, we're, we're also in a good mm-hmm. circle that uplifts each other. I think that's so important because it, it can be lonely running your own business. Yeah. I think it's important if you're a business owner to get involved in like business groups, like, you know, chamber of commerce is fine, but like other like very like, you know, we're in a, you know, referral networking group, like doing stuff like that, you're really getting involved and it, getting to know people and I think that there's a lot of power in like talking to other people that while they're not in the same industry they're running a business and they're in kind of the same struggles or they're in sales and they're in the same like you know going through the same ups and downs of you know sales and marketing and all that sort of that sort of stuff so I think I think doing that for people out there is important yeah and also aside from the referrals because like I'm th- I think about our networking group And how much it's helped me personally develop and as a CEO and like my business mindset, learning from 20 other people week after week where I go, oh, they're crushing it. Or I didn't think about that in that, you know, in that perspective, you know, like a a painter, you know, Filippo and and Certipro painters, like his insight to business in general is so valuable. And, you know, that week, if I don't get a referral, Mm -hmm, it doesn't matter. I got that insight. That's goal and so there's a lot Language more fair. to it also the community like we're talking about it to to help make sure that we're keeping each other company and in check and inspired and uplifted it's so important so Have i really fun. appreciate you bringing me into that yeah so i sure. wanted to make sure to thank you because you know you had invited me sales, and i went and i was sales. like okay i, I gotta save it's up about, and, it's just getting them in the room the right people find their way in the wrong people find yeah. their way out so i knew yeah. i knew you'd benefit from it so yeah Definitely. Yeah, certainly. So thanks for that. To leave anybody, especially you, you know, someone might be listening and go, yeah, I don't want to manage my finances. I can't. I don't have the know-how. 
How can they get in touch with you? How can you help them? You tell them. You got you ran the website. So <laughs> I would say, clientfocusedfinancial.com. There you go. That's, <laughs> yo, that's the spot. You go there, fill out the form. Um, I'll reach out to you and um, you know we can talk more uh, about your personal finances, your investment goals, concerns, issues that you're having going on. So happy to help anybody out there listening. Boom. Yeah. And I know from personal experience and the name of your uh, firm that you will personally reach out and you're you're gonna take care of yep. them. Uh, it just it means a lot knowing that because uh, money's a interesting thing and so serious. And for me, I never thought about like having someone invest money until you came into my life. And I feel so comfortable having you do that part, you know, managing our finances. So thanks for everything, yeah. and I look appreciate forward to the you. future. Definitely appreciate you. Appreciate you having me on here. Yeah, thanks, Dan.